Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Sequence Scientific Limited Q2 FY23 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Abhishek Singhal. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thanks, Ajahn. A very good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for Sequence Scientific's earnings conference call and for second quarter and half year ended financial year 2023. Today we have with us Mr. Raja Ram, Sequence Managing Director, Sharath, Joint Managing Director, and Mr. Raghavendra Ram, CFO, to share the highlights of the business and financials for the quarter. I hope you've gone through our results release and the quarterly investor presentation, which have been uploaded on our website as well as Stock Exchange website. The transcript of this call will be available in a week's time on the company's website. Please know that today's discussion may be forward-looking in nature and must be viewed in the relation to the risk pertaining to our business. After the end of this call, in case you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to the investor relations team. I now hand over the call to Mr. Rajaram to make the opening comments. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to our quarter two and H1 uh, FY23 earnings call. Joining me on this call is our CFO, Mr. P.B. Raghavendra Rao, and Mr. Sharad Narsapur, the Joint Managing Director of the company. As we complete half a year leading the sequin business, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the resiliency in our business and the grit of our team. The global macro environment continues to be quite uncertain, but equally it provides the opportunity for companies like us to make sharper choices in strategy and resource allocation. This can be especially challenging for a global company like ours as we operate right now in four countries with nine manufacturing facilities across three different continents. During the last quarter, we have faced multiple headwinds in the form of geopolitical issues in Europe, recessionary pressures in some of the economies, volatility in currencies, some rising prices, and of course, uncertainty in raw material supply. But we emphasize that these are short-term challenges and the team is taking strategic initiatives to adapt and overcome. You would have seen from our presentation, uh, in fact, on page four, where we have enlisted some strategic initiatives to win in such an environment. For example, we have reprioritized some of our markets and customer segments in both formulations and APIs. So let me now start with our formulations business. On the formulation side, we have realigned our focus markets to take advantage of some of the opportunities which are coming, and at the same time, to also allocate our resources appropriately. This can be seen in the way that we have bifurcated our revenue streams on page eight of our presentation and broadly categorized our business into three baskets of Europe, emerging markets, and India. I'll start with India. The Indian market has been growing at a very fast pace. In fact, it is growing in double digits in market terms. And we ourselves have been growing in double digits in the last three years and crossing the milestone of 1 billion rupees in annual revenue. You would have read about our recent announcement and I'm excited to announce that we have signed a definitive agreement to acquire a 100% stake in Tineta Pharma. The revenues of Tineta in FY22 were rupees 810 million approximately. It is a profitable business and this acquisition will be accretive to our EBITDA margin. It will also help us significantly to scale up our commercial presence in India in animal health and nearly double our current India formulation revenues. Tineta has a well-established presence of more than 25 years in the Indian market, specializing in the livestock segment. The business has established a premium vitamin brand in the nutritional segment, which is amongst the largest brands in the animal health portfolio. The Tineta portfolio comprises of more than 30 brands across nutritional supplements as well as therapeutic pharmaceutical formulations. 
They come with a 270 strong field force who are well experienced and the company is also supported by a deep distribution network and long-standing manufacturing partnerships. We are excited to welcome Tenita's experienced business team into the sequent family and even more happy that Mr. Vipin Chandan, who is one of the promoters of the company, will work with Sequent to transition and support this business integration. So going forward, India will remain one of our key focus markets, and we will aggressively scale up our formulation business, both manufacturing and R&D executed locally. In the emerging market segment, uh, which also includes fast-growing markets like Brazil and Turkey, we have seen very, very strong in-market growth, both in constant currency in the case of Brazil and Turkey, and in translated currency in the case of Brazil. Strategically, the emerging markets will cover different categories like poultry, cattle, and ruminant animals. In the acquisition of Nuri in Brazil earlier this year, we got a strategic entry into the fast-growing pet care segment while sustaining strong growth in the existing livestock segment. In Turkey, however, we have faced currency volatility uh, in addition to high inflation in the market, and that has resulted in some contraction in demand. While we did see strong market growth, as well as in-market constant currency growth, the currency challenges remain for us. And there is unprecedented surge in energy costs across Europe, and that has impacted some of our margins in our Europe business, particularly in Spain. The new rules in the European Union also restrict the routine use of antibiotics, and we are therefore adjusting our product portfolio to meet some of these regulatory requirements. We have identified an opportunity in nutritional additives and launched a few products which will aid in improving the gut health of animals, thereby reducing the dependence on traditional antibiotics. So our immediate attention in Turkey and Europe is to reshape the product mix, contain costs, and prioritize the segments that we operate. Overall, I'm happy to report that in the second quarter, in constant currency terms, the formulation business grew by 14.8% year-on-year and 1.1% year-on-year in reported currency, clocking a growth uh, and at the same time a revenue of rupees 2.3 billion, with the India and LATAM markets, of course, registering double-digit growth. In page seven of our presentation, we have shown the trajectory of the formulations business and you can see that it has grown at a three-year CAGR of 11%. And now with the acquisition, uh, proposed acquisition of Teneta, we should see accelerated levels on this. This level of growth, in fact, uh, is a testimony to the resilience of our globally diversified business. We now have a presence in more than 80 countries across the globe. Now coming to the API business. The macro environment has impacted even our end customers, and therefore we have seen subdued demand during the quarter. In addition, the current situation also resulted in higher input costs and pricing pressures, and therefore in the quarter, the API business generated a revenue of rupees 920 million. While it is a growth of 3.5% quarter on quarter, it is a decline on a year-on-year -year basis. For the half year, the revenue stood at rupees 1.8 billion. Our overall API margins uh, remain directionally stable, and we have also invested considerably in upgrading our facilities in the area of EHS and quality. But despite a slowdown in overall sales in our API business, we remain focused on the quality of our API sales because we believe that that will contribute towards the return to growth in the next few quarters. The contribution of sales to regulated markets is around 65%, which is a very strong position to be in. These are more stable and long-term, and they value the quality of our products as well as our manufacturing capabilities. We would also like you to note that the top 10 animal health companies in the world are now our customers and this basket comprises about 45% of our sales. 
and this has grown from 28% just two years ago. On the new product front, we are accelerating our pipeline development efforts by expanding our teams in the API R&D setup, and at the same time, we're also building necessary capabilities for new product development and launch. At present, around 10% of our revenues uh, come from new products, and this is a significant increase from just 2% a few years ago. Now, this setup and investment in R&D will help us bring new products in a much shortened time frame. We now have three CDMO projects at different stages of development. So all these initiatives are in preparation for future growth as we begin to set ourselves towards building a high-quality API business, which is founded on sales to regulated markets, new products, and the share of top 10 customers. I'm also happy to announce that the Mahart site has received the EcoVadis Sustainability Silver Medal and Certificate, and, and that sort of reinforces our commitment to sustainability, and it's a significant milestone for us. And in addition to that, of course, we continue to have our EU GMP-approved facilities upgraded to meet all EHS standards. Having said that, overall, this has not been a very easy quarter. There have been many macro factors uh, which have uh, prevailed, uh, created some uncertainty, and the results overall may seem a bit disappointing, but our diversified portfolio and our deep capabilities, in fact, give us the opportunity to win in such an environment by renewing our focus on priority markets, priority segments, implementing strong profit improvement plans, and more importantly, I think, as evidenced by our recent initiative, it shows our confidence to grow strategically, even through acquisitions, reinforcing our sequent 2.0 strategy. We expect that these moves will play out more favorably for us in the coming quarters. I'll now hand over uh, to our CFO, Mr. Raghavendra Rao, to provide an update on the financial performance. Thank you, Raja. Good evening, everyone. I will begin by detailing the proposed acquisition. Yesterday, our board had approved the acquisition of Tineta Pharma for an enterprise value of 218 crores. Uh, a part of this will be paid as cash consideration, which is about uh, rupees 153 crores, and the other part will be by way of preferential allotment of sequence equity shares of INR 65 crores. The acquisition will be immediately accretive uh, for Sequent, significantly scaling up Sequent's commercial presence in India with near doubling of our current India revenues. Tineta's revenues stood at 81 crores for FI22, delivering a double-digit YOI growth. With the addition of Tineta, Sequent's India business, which is fast-growing, will have an annualized combined revenues of approximately rupees 190 crores. I will now briefly update on the key metrics for Q2 and H1 of FI23. Our total revenue for the quarter is at rupees 3.4 billion and has increased by 2.9% YOI in constant currency terms. The major driving force of the growth has been our formulation business, which contributed rupees 2.4 billion with a strong 14.8% year-on-year constant currency growth. On reported basis, formulation business is up by 1.3% year-on-year. The emerging market business continues its growth momentum, delivering a revenue of rupees 1.1 billion with a robust 34.2% constant currency growth. India business has also delivered 10.9% growth with a revenue of rupees 319 million. Euro business has suffered macro headwinds and is down by 7.3%, contributing rupees 899 million. The contribution from API business stands at rupees 920 million. In Q2, the EBITDA, excluding ESOP costs, stood at rupees 150 million, while the reported EBITDA came in at rupees 51 million after considering the ESOP cost of rupees 98 million. <coughs> Gross margins continue to hold despite 
the challenges like inflation in our key input materials. Overall operating cost remains flat uh, despite inflation pre uh, pressures and we have incurred about uh, rupees 32 million uh, for plant quality and improvement initiatives during the quarter. In H1 FY23, the formulation business clocked a revenue of rupees 4.8 billion with a strong 17.1% year-on-year constant currency growth. The API business was at rupees 1.8 billion. Overall reported sales for H1 is at rupees 6.8 billion and are up 7.5% in constant uh, currency terms and 1.2% in reported terms. In H1, EBITDA excluding ESOP stood at uh, Rs. 351 million, while the reported EBITDA is at Rs. 161 million after considering ESOP cost of about 190 million. Due to continuing inflation in Turkey, which, constitutes, which continues to be above 100%, over the last three years on a cumulative basis. Accounting under India's 29 financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies continues to be triggered for us. Accordingly, the financial statements of subsidiaries in Turkey have been prepared in accordance with India's 29, which has impacted our consolidated EBITDA by about 24 million for the quarter. Going ahead, I'm very confident that we will resume our growth trajectory. Thank you very much. And we can now open for Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of <coughs> Rishabh Jain, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is on the Tineta Pharma acquisition. So could you please talk a bit about this acquisition? So basically what kind of products have we acquired and what are the synergies that we are looking at this acquisition? And also on the financial side, if you could help me understand the FY22 top line was around 81 crores. So how has this business performed during H1 FY23? And what is the EBITDA margins for this entity? So this is my first question. Can you also just ask the second question? Yeah, my second question is on the overall India business. So currently the business is around 190 crores today along with the acquisition. I wanted to understand how large can this business be over the next three to four years and what kind of growth rate do you envisage for the India business? Okay, thank you for the uh, for the question. So to give you a bit about what Pineta Pharma is, it is uh, a 25-year-old company which was founded by three promoters and uh, who have had deep experience in the animal health industry. And uh, over the period of uh, the last 25 years, they've built uh, a portfolio of products in this company. And uh, the products largely uh, cover, uh, you know, nutritional supplements and some pharmaceutical formulations for the livestock uh, segment, which is largely uh, for cattle. Uh, the brands that they have are very well established. Um, one of the larger brand, in fact, the largest brand that they have in the portfolio is a brand called Vitam, and the Vitam range itself is uh, more than uh, 50 crores uh, in, in terms of sales, making it one of the larger sort of animal health brands that we have. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, it comes with a strong sort of uh, field force, which is around 270 people who are very experienced in this business. And uh, therefore, when we look at the synergies, 
which we are talking about. Uh, you know, we also have a animal health business specializing in livestock cattle, and that's uh, about 100 crores uh, with, uh, you know, more than 100 people. So the combined business uh, which you would look at would be around 190 crores with one of the, you know, larger, stronger field forces uh, in India, as well as, of course, a portfolio of uh, very strong products, uh, many of them complementary. Uh, from a pure synergy point of view, we see a lot of growth synergies because there's an opportunity for a lot of cross-sell, upsell, which is possible through, uh, you know, the combined team. And also with a strong front end, which is there with the uh, Tineta team and our strong sort of back-end capabilities in terms of R&D product development, uh, potentially API integration. Uh, we see that uh, you know there's an opportunity for us to speedily launch a lot more products and uh, build this business. So there is going to be both expansion uh, as well as depth possible in this portfolio. Uh, in terms of the broad financials of this of uh, Tineta, uh, we it is about 81 crores of sales in FY uh, 22. Uh, I'm unable to give you a number for the first half because uh, you know. Uh, it's still an unaudited kind of figure, which we haven't, uh, which we have an idea about. But uh, all that I can say is that, you know, they have generally grown in, uh, you know, high double digits uh, in the recent times, to between 10 and 20 percent every year over the last uh, three to four years. And uh, as we know that the first half is, you know, tracking quite well in line with our plans, and uh, so therefore. Uh, you know, we expect that uh, FY23 will also be a strong business uh, when it integrates with us. Um, as far as the overall India business uh, opportunity is concerned, right now it's about 190 crores. The market in general is growing, uh, you know, anywhere between 8 and 10 percent uh, in this business. So our ambition is to grow much faster uh, than the market after we combine. And uh, therefore, of course, in addition to growth, we also expect uh, you know, synergies in terms of margins. Uh, here's another question, what's the margin profile of uh, Tineta? So generally it's in high teens, uh, that's the kind of a margin profile, so uh, depending on the year and depending on the mix. So that's broadly the kind of uh, uh, EBITDA profile that we see for the Tineta business. Um, and uh, that's what we think will help in you know quick creative effect as well as allow us to get more synergies. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Reminder to the participants: anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one. Reminder to the participants, please press star and one again. Reminder to the participants to please press star and one again. The next question is from the line of Vishwash Nandwani, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi. So my question pertains to the EPI business. So in the first half of FY23, we have seen 181 crores of revenue, uh, which is a decline of 10% in YOI. So what has been the major contributors here? And if we see the second half of FY23, would the revenue be largely flat or second half we can see a stronger revenue than the first half? And pertaining to this, the annualized levels for FY23, so uh, according to the numbers, will we go down by 9 to 10 percent versus FY22 on a full year basis? And is this a new base which we can assume uh, the forecast for our FY23? And on FY23 base, how do you see the growth over the medium term? And what would be the drivers for these growth? And my second question pertains to the new product, which have contributed approximately 10 percent of your API sales. So how would this pan out based on your pipeline and conversation with your customer? And is the margin profile of these new products better than existing uh, business margins? So these are my two questions. Okay, a lot of questions. I'll try and answer uh, one at a time. 
Uh, so our first half uh, API revenues are at about 180 crores, and uh, I think uh, there are, uh, it's certainly lesser than uh, you know what we had uh, planned. Uh, and I have listed some of the reasons which were there. Uh, of course, if you look out on a full last six months basis, there have been a combination of reasons. Some internal, uh, for example, like the fire incident that we had, uh, but at the same time. Uh, there has been uh, pressure on the demand side, particularly at the end of our end customers, uh, which is therefore translated into uh, either lesser quantities which have been ordered or to some extent uh, a delay in the purchase. Uh, and uh, like I said, you know, our con uh, customers are, uh, you know, at this point of time also operating in markets uh, which have uh, some of the economic headwinds which are there. And that does translate to some extent back uh, to the uh, you know API uh, industry as well. So having said that, um, you know I, while I can't sort of give you a, a forward-looking statement on what the second half will be like, uh, it is uh, more likely to be a little better than the first half. But uh, having said that, uh, you know we do not expect that uh, it will uh, be at the levels at which we did uh, last year, and I think uh, it would only be fair to say that it may be a marginally better than the uh, first half. And uh, this is something that will, however, accelerate as we move into the next, uh, you know, uh, three to four quarters, uh, which is what I've spoken to you about on some of the initiatives that you know we are taking and the responses that we are getting. So I think yeah, it would be uh, reasonable to say that. To some extent, the, we are rebasing the uh, API uh, annual number, and uh, we should be looking more uh, in the rebased uh, FY23 uh, to sort of set the platform uh, for future growth. Uh, now, uh, where will the uh, you know annualized number land up with? I think uh, you know. I think it, from whatever I've spoken, it should be. Uh, you know, the second half will be slightly better than the first half, uh, but uh, you know, not in the anywhere in the area of what we expected. Uh, you know, to grow versus last year. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of uh, uh, you know where we are seeing the future plans on this, definitely uh, we believe that there are the most important thing for us is in such an environment to improve the quality of our business. So we continue to focus on our regulated markets. Uh, which are about two thirds of uh, you know our business right now, and uh, that is more stable business which we need to build. And towards that, we are launching a lot of uh, you know new products, and uh, it is already 10% uh, of our portfolio. And uh, you know we certainly would want to keep increasing that. Um, we have uh, uh, you know a large number of products which are at different stages of development. Uh, in API, some of them uh, ready to launch uh, from quarter four, end quarter four or early quarter one, and that should get us some incremental revenue, and then of course scale up uh, from there. And looking at if, you know the future years, yes, we want to certainly grow on the rebased uh, FY23. Uh, we would expect to grow in you know double digits in terms of top line uh, from the new base that we have. Uh, in FY23, uh, but what we expect is that the quality of the growth, the margins that we will have, as well as the sustainability of that business, will be significantly improved and better than what it is today. Uh, now, uh, coming to the last uh, part of it, on how will the margins for new products be? Typically, uh, when you launch a new product, uh, you know, because uh, in the initial a few quarters, uh, it tends to be lower than the aggregate margin that you have, but then it rapidly uh, sort of increases uh, after a few quarters, and that is why you need to have a continuous cycle of API launches, which are you know sort of quickly reaching the sort of targeted margin. And because we are talking to regulated customers as well as the top API uh, you know veterinary companies. Uh, we expect that you know these will be sustainable margins without any kind of a currency impact, etc. So that's I think uh, in summary where we think the API business will go.
Mr. Nandwani, does that answer your question? Yes, that helps. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nikun Jain from NJ Investment. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi, Nikun. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Actually, it's um, in depth and it's a very good presentation. Uh, my question is first related to the Europe business. So the Europe business has further weakened in the quarter. We, uh, so the uh, Q on Q uh, constant currency growth also what we can uh, we can see is negative 11.2%. Uh, so just wanted to know the reason like what's going on in that uh, that geographical area, and uh, when do we see to uh, see this business to recover in Europe? Hello, are you on the call? Uh, Hello. You got disconnected. Yeah, I can hear you. So, just ask your question. When do we see this business recovering? Is that your question? Yeah. So, uh, wanted to know the reason of further, you know, weakening of the euro business. So, what's happening? What's the situation there now? And uh, when do we start? Uh, when do we see to see that this business will recover from the current situation? Yeah. So. Thanks for the question. Now, I think our Europe business, which is the formulation business, has got two components. There is a, a large component which we sell uh, within uh, countries like Spain, where we have a strong, uh, you know, antibiotic-based uh, uh, portfolio. And then, of okay. course, we have a distribution portfolio where we distribute for some of the larger companies. Uh, what we are seeing is really pressure coming at two ends. One is, in general, of course, the economic conditions, uh, you know, because of uh, all the European issues related to, to war, to increasing price of fertilizers, and all of those things have resulted in a uh, reduction in demand at the uh, farmer level. And therefore, we are seeing some pressure coming in in terms of the demand side. Uh, how long will that continue? I really I don't know. It's a very macro sort of situation, depending on the war and the pressures which are there. Uh, the second question is really in relation to demand is the one on the control on antibiotic usage, which has come through quite significantly in uh, in Europe. Uh, there we are immediately, of course, uh, you know, rejigging our portfolio, and we think that you know, we, uh, in the next uh, four to six quarters, we should be able to adjust the portfolio and begin to see growth coming from that. But I think the larger question in uh, Europe is the rise of, you know, some of the energy costs, input costs on account of gas and uh, fertilizer, et cetera, which is happening. And therefore, our focus now is to make sure that we are profitable in Europe. And therefore, we are taking initiatives to make sure that while the market you know, eventually recovers, which we can't predict right now, uh, we will at our end, however, uh, be very, uh, you know, determined to reduce our cost base, uh, make sure that we are investing in profitable products, improving our margin, and therefore use this opportunity to create a fairly, you know, profitable, robust business which uh, is more sort of sustainable. So I would say that uh, if the economic and the situation comes back, then I think in about four to six quarters, we should see top-line growth coming back in Europe. Uh, but having said that, we certainly expect uh, profit improvement coming in Europe very quickly because of the actions that we are taking. Okay. So are we seeing any sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in lower uh, normalization of the energy cost in Europe? You know, I think we are... We cannot predict that right now. Uh, the energy costs uh, did shoot up. Uh, they have, you know, stabilized a bit. But uh, uh, I think uh, we can. We have to do what we can control, and what's within our control is to make sure that we are profitable. We don't sort of, uh, you know, chase costs which are not, uh, you know, defendable immediately, and therefore make sure we are on the right product mix and uh, conserve our cash and keep our profits. And I think that's what, while at the same time, use this opportunity to reshape our portfolio. Because I think such kind of, uh, you know, difficult situation gives us a very good opportunity to, uh, you know, walk away from uh, certain low margin businesses and at the same time invest in high margin businesses when companies may be, you know, when the competition may 
not be taking the same kind of initiative. So it helps us to prepare for a stronger business in Europe. Yeah, okay. but I don't think we can look at stuff which we can't control. Okay. Of course, you know, uh, just uh, initiatives like you know, look at alternative mm-hmm. source of energy and things like that, which we are implementing in mm-hmm. our plants. Uh, mm-hmm. But that having been said, we're doing that in you know both Spain, Turkey, etc. But I think the key question in such uh, you know when a lot of the things are not in your control, uh, I think we have to just make sure that we focus on the things which are in our control and keep ourselves more profitable uh, and ready to you know take the advantage when the market sort of stabilizes. Yeah, got it. Uh, just a broader question on the same euro. Uh, so the last uh, three year uh, CAGR, if I see, it comes to around five uh, percent. Uh, three year, uh, three year CAGR of the business. So structure, structurally, is it a five to seven percent growth market, or uh, so even if if everything normalizes and if 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 we start getting back the top line, uh, can we grow at a double digit? Uh, percentage? Um, so look, uh, right now, in fact, it depends on which portfolio you're in. I think the market mm-hmm. right now is more in you know low single digit kind of a, a growth. On a CAGR basis, yes, the market was growing uh, you know at five to seven percent. But uh, I would say that right now, if there are opportunities to grow certain segments of the market uh, much faster, but more from a you know, profitable growth point of view. So I would, uh, you know, say that, you know, which way this growth will go, uh, I cannot say much about the overall market right now because it's dependent on many factors, but we are committed to sort of, you know, making sure that our margins improve and uh, we are growing in what are the profitable part of the portfolio. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Bhavya Shah from GV Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir, you're on. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, sir. Uh, so I have two questions from my side. Uh, so the first question is, uh, as we can see that uh, gross margin has further declined by 100 bits in this quarter. So just wanted to understand, uh, is this the bottom or are we expecting any further deterioration? So I'll just invite Raghav to yes. give the initial comments on this. Yeah. See, from the uh, business perspective, uh, gross margin is stable. Uh, what has happened is uh, because of this hyperinflationary accounting, we have, we have had to take some uh, heat on the gross margin. So it's about 1.1% impact on the gross margin. If you remove that, the gross margins are uh, stable. Okay, okay, that helps. Uh, and my second question is, uh, have we started seeing some cooling uh, of in packing material cost or solvent prices, any prices changes or things? Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 if you see YOY, we can see the RMC impact, but I think it has stabilized. The the increase has uh, a little bit of stabilized, so QOQ, the impact is not that significant. Okay. Okay. That's from my side. Thank you. It has not come down yeah. yet. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vishal from Systematics. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, on the API business, uh, you had talked about a $10 million supply order from a global uh, top 10 company. So has that uh, supply order uh, commercialized? Sorry, just, just give me one minute. Sorry, I'll just give you the number. Hang on. So, uh, yes, so, uh, you know, we have, the 10 million has not yet uh, uh, materialized, but the start of the supplies uh, certainly has, uh, you know, materialized, and we have started uh, in the last, uh, in fact, this quarter, we have started, uh, you know, supplying uh, some of the requirements, and uh, we are hoping that it will translate on an annualized basis to, uh, to the full 10 million opportunity, yeah? 
Uh, but as I said earlier, that uh, it is the, all customers are slowing down a bit on the demand side of it. So while you know we may not uh, realize the entire uh, value which was originally envisaged, uh, I think we are we've been qualified as the supplier to them, and therefore we will continue to supply whatever are their requirements, and it could be somewhere in between. Uh, you know the number which is there, which we have indicated somewhere below that. But it has already started uh, in terms of supply this quarter. So you might not have booked a pro rata number this quarter. Is that fair to assume? And yeah, I don't think it's a pro rata number yet uh, because uh, you know the initial quarter is always lower when you start. And uh, should we expect uh, the API business to bounce back in? Uh, subsequent quarters or it will depend upon the macroeconomic situation overall? So I think the macroeconomic situation is what it is. Uh, and uh, it has definitely impacted the overall uh, sort of opportunity. But I think I spoke to one of uh, the speakers earlier. Uh, we expect uh, the second half of this year to be a little better than the first half of the year, but not the kind of buoyancy which we were expecting earlier. But uh, subsequently, I think, uh, you know, with the uh, larger sort of regulated market contracts that we are uh, finalizing, uh, we should see a bounce back happening on the API business. But it will be a bit of a slow recovery, but each quarter should be better than, you know, the earlier, each half should be better than the uh, earlier one going ahead. Like uh, you have a large number of VMS, ordinary master files uh, filed in the U.S. Uh, but you would not be supplying most of those. Uh, so any sense on uh, how these VMFs will, will get triggered into commercial supply? In, say a number like uh, maybe every year, do you expect some some of these VMFs to be commercialized and add to your business meaningfully? Yeah, I'll invite uh, Mr. Sharat Narsapur uh, to evaluate to answer that on how many would we sort of trigger one every year. Yeah, yeah uh, certainly. I mean, uh, there are multiple VMFs, and uh, we are one of the leading VMF fighters. And all have uh, actually uh, interest of customers. And I would guess that at least one would get commercialized because you know the commercialization process itself is a uh, uh, you know a long drawn process uh, of validation and changing the source, etc. So certainly we can expect to commercialize at least one of them. So one every year, is that uh, how we should look at? Yeah. yeah, I think that's reasonable to look at, but uh, the value of each could be quite different. Mm -hmm. yeah, depending on, on how, how large can each uh, each opportunity would be? I don't, I don't want to sort of right now give an indication, but as and when we commercialize them, we will definitely be able to give you some indication on, you know, depending on which one we commercialize first. Yeah? Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And, on, and on Europe, just one thing: is there an incremental change on the regulations in terms of usage of antibiotics, or these are the these these are just the old regulation and the implementation has got stricter? Uh, I think you're right. Uh, the regulations are uh, more than three years old, uh, but uh, it has uh, been staggered in the implementation. And the markets uh, where, you know, we have a significant presence right now, which is markets like Spain and the Mediterranean countries, uh, have been the last to adopt those regulations. Uh, and therefore, it's been more aggressive in this period. But I think uh, we were, in some sense, uh, developing uh, new products, uh, which are, you know, nutritional products, uh, which are alternatives to uh, the use of extensive use of antibiotics, and therefore, I think we will, uh, you know, see a shift in the portfolio mix, which should, at some point of time, balance out. Mm -hmm. So, what yeah. percentage of your Europe sales would be antibiotics now? Look, I think uh, I don't want to hazard a guess. Probably by the end of the call, I'll try and come back to let you know what it is. Uh, but again, as I said, it's not a ban, okay, on any of the antibiotics which we use, it is a decreasing usage of it, yeah, because of the new regulation in terms of now requiring veterinarians to prescribe uh, each of the antibiotics, and that in generally therefore constricts the demand to some extent versus free usage, which was being, uh, you know, the practice over there, 
but it, it, it's a, it therefore restricts some of the access to antibiotics uh, for farmers, etc. But uh, and therefore results in a periodic sort of slowdown, and therefore you would need to shift your portfolio to cope up, make up for that. Okay, thank you. I, any question? Thank you. We'll move on to the next question from the line of Udit Bukaria from Katamaran. Please go ahead. Yeah. Sir, if you can just highlight what was the total con in albendazole so free. Mr. Bukaria, please increase the volume of your device. The audio Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, sir, if you can tell us about albendazole sales in the API and uh, how what was the peak number two, three years ago? Uh, so our uh, albendazole business, uh, uh, at a point of time about uh, three years ago, used to be uh, in about 15 odd percent uh, of our total business, and uh, today it is uh, down, uh, you know, to single uh, to less than 10 percent. And so, when can we expect the bounce back? Because right now, I'm guessing COVID is gone, and everyone has started. Uh, going out. So, when how are you seeing the traction in this business? Uh, so, we are sorry. Uh, I think I just invite Sharad to speak about it. No, maybe Sharad, you can also clarify on the yeah. yeah. I think the, the traction numbers. Yeah. Yes. The traction is uh, uh, certainly looking uh, positive uh, in terms of uh, almond dissolved demand. However, you should realize that uh, there is a pressure on the pricing. So okay. that may skew the numbers, but in terms of volumes, yes, it is going up. And if you can share, like, what has the pricing decline been, like, in this uh, molecule for this? Well, particular? generally, as Raja was mentioning, you know, there is a demand. Uh, when the demand has increased, there is the expectation on the pricing. Mm -hmm. So I can't give you the numbers right now, but then uh, the volumes certainly are growing. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anand Trivedi from Nepian Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. My first question is, uh, given the cost pressures in Europe, uh, is there an opportunity to move some of the manufacturing in India and uh, benefit from a lower cost uh, in India? Uh I think in Europe, uh, what we manufacture and uh, uh, sell at this point of time are more the, you know, uh, antibiotic range and the feed range and the nutritional supplements uh, kind of products. And uh, that uh, India, you know, uh, from a point of view of supply from here in terms of uh, it's not too competitive to be able to do that. There are also uh, it serves local markets over there, and therefore there is the advantage of, uh, you know, serving local markets from a manufacturing location over there itself, because it's a bit more on the agri side rather than on the uh, pharma side in terms of the consumption channels. Uh, so it's not so much of a distinctive advantage to uh, do that uh, in India. Okay, and given what's happening in Europe, uh, are there any m &E opportunities that are opening up out there? Sorry, can you just repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, you know, given the stress you're seeing in the European markets, just the way you made an acquisition in India, are there any m &E opportunities opening up in Europe that you could look at? So uh, from a full-fledged, uh, you know, uh, company acquisition, uh, you know, we are always uh, uh, alive to that. Uh, but, you know, at this point of time, we are not sort of able to, we are not sort of in the play for anything. However, uh, given that we have a strong commercial front end uh, in uh, Europe, not just in Spain, but also in uh, Benelux, in Italy, in uh, Sweden, uh, we are uh, being considered for distribution uh, by some of the large uh, animal health companies. Uh, we already today distribute for two of the you know, top 15 uh, companies in these countries, and there are some others who are keen on looking at it, and that is a fairly clean sort of margin-driven accredited business. So that we are, solid, you know, actively pursuing, and there are opportunities which could come soon. And speaking of distribution, and I may be a little dated on this in terms of my information, but how is the Zoetis distribution uh, deal going? 
So we do that in India uh, for their uh, cattle range. And, uh, you know, it's been a very uh, successful partnership now for nearly two years. And uh, it is, uh, we are growing that business uh, over here uh, in double digits. And uh, we are also, uh, you know, getting a lot of support from them in terms of, you know, commercial excellence, in terms of sales force excellence, in terms of marketing support. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we see that business going because this is also, therefore, the channel for them to launch any of their new products, uh, which is what we are looking in the next, uh, you know, one to two years coming from Zoetis. So it's a double-digit growth business uh, right now for us here. And is there a number you can put on that in terms of, of the 55 crores in the first half in India in revenues? How much is from uh, Zoetis? So um, it is uh, roughly in the you know in around 40 or 40 to 50 percent of our business broadly would be depending on the kind of quarter you are because you know some of their products uh, uh, are uh, at different uh, seasons the depending on the therapy and the disease but you know roughly about 40 or percent would be the kind of value still there. the balance 60 percent of that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Tavkar from IFL AMC. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, uh, excluding the cross currency impact, uh, uh, would you like to quantify uh, what kind of revenue growth we have done and also uh, the core EBITDA margin to that extent? Yeah, yeah, Robert, yeah. yeah. so. Uh, Q Q of Q growth in uh, in terms of uh, you know in, in the constant uh, sorry you are asking without uh, currency impact right yes yeah yeah so why why on half daily basis we grew at 4.5 percent in formulation and about uh, uh, at the overall level it's about 1.2 percent okay and then uh, had this cross currency impact not been there uh, what would be the kind of beta margins uh, we would have got to see. Yeah, uh, without uh, uh, in a constant currency basis, uh, we would have grown at 7.5 percent on the uh, on the reported sales in H1. So that would uh, uh, give me at least two to two and a half percentage points. So that's a, a different number, a difficult number to give immediately. Yeah, I come back to you on that. Uh, on the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, so just one last question. So, uh, you know, the journey towards, uh, you know, achieving 15% plus EBITDA margins. Uh, uh, so currently we first half year at 6% adjusted for all the ESOPs. Uh, um, would you like to give any timelines as to when can we, you know, uh, reach those mid teens kind of EBITDA margins? Uh, would it be two years, three years out? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly our uh, uh, aspiration to uh, you know, get it uh, to that level in, in the next, uh, you know, four to six quarters. Four to eight quarters, I would imagine that, you know, we should be looking. But some of it will depend on the action and how they sort of turn out in the next, uh, you know, two quarters. But without giving any sort of guidance, that's certainly the ambition for us uh, in a two-year horizon. Okay, fair enough. And just one, one last question. Within the contract manufacturing space, are you guys... Uh, uh, you know, tapping some other international uh, customers, you know, because the kind of facilities that we have at, at our disposal, I guess uh, so most of them are underutilized. So any plans as to how, you know, you'd make sure the utilization levels go up? So on the API side, of course, we are, uh, you know, everything is to other customers, right? It's a B2B business. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, there are some which are, uh, you know, we manufacture and we search for customers, and there is, of course, a portion where, you know, is a CDMO kind of business where we are specifically developing for customers, right? So that's there. On the formulation side, certainly in uh, the facilities that we have right now in uh, Europe as well as uh, in Turkey, uh, we do some manufacturing for third parties uh, in the sense uh, both, uh, you know, some degree of formulation work and packing. Uh, and uh, that will continue, but that's more, uh, and any opportunity to fill up uh, any of these capacities, provided it's profitable, uh, we would do it. But uh, at this point of time, we, 
you know, I think given the overall, uh, you know, demand situation, we're not seeing any acceleration in it. We do some bit of it in Europe right now. Hmm. Uh, no, this is helpful. Uh, thanks so much and all the best. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to paucity of time, we will take one last question from the line of Aditya Khemka from Incred PMS. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so, one question on the uh, acquisition. So, how are we going to fund the cash consideration for the acquisition? Uh, so, look, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, a clear plan. Obviously, it's a combination of uh, issue of uh, presidential equity, which we have uh, already declared. In addition to that, uh, there is uh, internal cash generation, as well as uh, some restructuring of uh, internal intercompany uh, financing, and that's what will that's what will get us into there. And uh, you know, so that's the way we're going to sort of fund it. And, uh, and more like at closing, we should uh, get a you know clearer sense of how we would want to utilize the various sources that we have. Understood. And and can we can we uh, talk about the German plant? I think you know, given the again the crisis in Europe, both on power side and you know other logistic costs. How do you feel uh, the German plant uh, is doing right now? And was the utilization there? And was the plan there? Because the understanding was that uh, whatever we produce in Germany, we are likely to sell in the U.S. Uh, now with the cost escalating in Germany, but not so much in U.S., uh, is our production in Germany still going to be competitive compared to the local U.S. production? I think there are two components to it. Uh, the German plant uh, uh, also manufactures uh, products for sale in Europe and other markets, uh, emerging markets. Uh, so that part of the business uh, is continuing. Uh, the second part of the German plant was to prepare it uh, for manufacturing injectables for the U.S. And that was, we were expecting that, you know, we would trigger a U.S. Uh, FDA kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, inspection and qualification uh, later in this year or middle of next year. Uh, we're trying to sort of stick to that timeline because that would make it a, uh, a facility where we would be able to manage. There aren't too many places in the world where, uh, you know, injectables for animal health uh, products are manufactured even now. So we continue to remain on that. But having said that, uh, there is a cost impact which has come there in terms of utilities, etc. So we are scaling back a bit in terms of the cost structure there manufacturing, and we'll be taking a closer decision on that more after we are clear, uh, you know, when we can do the uh, uh, potential US FDA, uh, you know, readiness in the plant. So I think we'll come back to you on that probably more in about six months when, you know, a lot of these moving parts would come in place and then we would be able to take a better decision. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now have the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you very much for all of you who have uh, joined uh, this call. As I said, uh, uh, it is a challenging time for uh, you know uh, the entire industry, but at the same time, I think it is in these challenging times that it gives us a real opportunity to uh, make some choices, uh, make some uh, you know more strategic decisions, and uh, ensure that you know we are focusing on sustainable, profitable growth. And uh, that's what uh, we are doing. We are making sure that whatever we are doing is not completely influenced by the circumstances of today, but we are readying ourselves to become a stronger, more sustainable business. And in that process, there will be, you know, the odd quarter where we will have to, uh, you know, chin up and face it, but make sure that we are doing the right thing for the future. And that's what makes us very confident that all the actions that we are taking right now will ensure that our sequent 2.0 strategy gets implemented. And I think the acquisition of Tineta, uh, the agreement which we have signed, is one of the most definitive steps which we have uh, taken in that direction. So thank you very much for joining uh, and wish you uh, a wonderful time for the rest of the year uh, before we meet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Sequence Scientific Limited, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your line.